good friends at the Chicago Federation of Labor. All right, we're now streaming everybody on YouTube. I didn't hit the button. We're streaming. Frank weighed in on Facebook. Hey, what's going on? What's going on, Frank? Glad you're still listening. The Ben Jarofsky Show, it starts now. It is Thursday, October 3rd, and live from the Chicago Sun-Times Chicago Reader Studio on Racine Avenue, this is the Ben Jarofsky Show. Today on the program, In These Times, writer Miles Kompflassen will join us. Will he talk about chicken sandwiches? I don't know. Gonna have to wait to find out. Union man Ed Maher returns, and we welcome Illinois State Rep. Chris Welch. And now your host, lover of chicken sandwiches, <laughs> Chicago Reader yeah. columnist Ben Jarofsky. Hello, everybody. Ben Jarofsky here. We're calling this Scaredy Cat Thursday. And here's why. Today's paper brought news of the defiant rally yesterday at Chicago Teachers Union headquarters. Three separate sets of employees right here in the city of Chicago are ready to go on strike. They're declaring their intention to go on strike uh, unless Mayor Lori Lightfoot meets their demands. That would be, let's see, the Chicago Teachers Union. Obviously, we've been talking a lot about them. Uh, SEIU uh, 73 representing uh uh, non-teaching employees at the Board of Education and also Park District employees, all threatening to go on strike. All um, behalf of union supporters everywhere on in the city of Chicago, let me say, I'm with the union 100%. And also let me say, I am scared. This is a very scary time and I wanna be defiant and I wanna say I'm afraid of absolutely nothing, but let's be real folks. When people uh, vote to go on strike, when they put their lives and their livelihoods uh, in jeopardy that way and expose themselves to so much, they could go broke without the income that they need to pay all their basic bills. It's a scary, frightening time. And just think about it. Think about how hard and difficult it is for any of us out here just to ask an employer for a raise. I don't know if you ever had to do that, but you just have to stand up and say to your employer, uh, I would like a raise. Well, imagine this uh, on a much larger level I know there's strength in numbers, but just think about that, about this. The employer is pretty powerful. It's Lori Lightfoot. And she is backed by virtually every single media outlet, mainstream media outlet in the city of Chicago. D, every time I turn around, I see another editorial or a column uh, mocking the teachers, denouncing their demands, trivializing their demands, marginalizing their demands. The Chicago Tribune today just had one. Let's see my not beloved Chicago Tribune. What did it say, D? Mayor Lightfoot, you've offered CTU a more than fair deal. Don't cave. All right. So uh, it's not as though there's a lot of media support uh, for the teachers or the SEIU members or the park district employees, etc. So it's very scary. And people, a lot of people have a hard time asking for this. I know I have a difficult time asking for something. Other people are blessed with the, like the entitlement gene. I think one of the most obvious examples would be our current president, President Donald Trump, who feels so entitled to things that he somehow or other figured out a way not only to have a building in the most centrally located part of town where you can see it from the Chicago River, you can see it from the L, but he has got his name uh, emblazoned on top of that building for the whole world to see. Here he is in the, in the city of Chicago where he's widely reviled. Over 80% of the people can guarantee will vote against him anytime he's on the ballot. And there's his name emblazoned for everyone to see. Biggest name out there. That's a man with a sense of entitlement. It's a lot harder for ordinary working people, for teachers, for park district employees to feel that same sense of entitlement. So that's why they act collect collectively and they're up against so much, it's so powerful. In this city, and I know this for a fact because I've been writing uh, from for an alternative newspaper since the 80s. In this city, there's sort of a conventional wisdom uh, when it comes to the leadership of the town. And the conventional wisdom is that you get in line and you stay in line and you cut individual deals and you don't buck the system. Your troublemakers are not appreciated in this town. And when a union stands up and says they're willing to go on strike uh, because they don't believe the offer that the bosses uh, are giving them is good enough, 
Uh, they are then labeled troublemakers by and large by uh, the people who run this town. So it's a very scary, frightening time. You're labeled a troublemaker. If you open up the newspapers, you're not going to see a lot of support unless you're reading the reader uh, and <laughs> an alternative newspaper. Uh, and uh, so I, I give I, I give a lot of credit to the uh, CTU members, uh, to the park district employees, and to the other school uh, employees who have uh, taken this risk to go on strike. Uh, you're never going to be appreciated by the powers that be in the city of Chicago for being defiant and for standing up for your rights. And in the case of the teachers union, I also think they're making some exceedingly common sense proposals to try to force the city to do something it should have done a long time ago. And that is to guarantee that every school in the city of Chicago has some basic employees like nurses and social workers and counselors and librarians and lower class size. So I think they're doing the right thing, but it is a scary time folks, because they're up against a lot now. My guess is, my hunch is, that push comes to shove, most people in the city of Chicago, ordinary people in the city of Chicago, who are not part of sort of the ruling class, if you will, uh, will be on the side of the strikers. But we don't know until it goes down. Like I said, very scary time. We got a great show today, everybody. Miles Conflassen will be in here from In These Times. I think Miles is on the side of the potential strikers. See what he has to say on the labor issues. Also, uh, talk to him about uh, Republican strategies toward impeachment. Also, get a Bernie update. Uh, in, you know, Bernie had the um, stent operation yesterday. See how Bernie's doing. Bernie Sanders, of course. And also talk maybe about Ken Griffin. I just saw this story was breaking. Ken Griff Griffin, the hedge fund owner, uh, owner of Citadel, one of the richest men in the state of Illinois, if not the richest man in the state of Illinois, will now have his name emblazoned on the Museum of Science and Industry. Uh, I remember five billion years ago when I was in seventh or eighth grade, we went on a field trip to the Museum of Science and Industry, and it was like the Museum of Science and Industry. Now little kids are being going on the, we're going to the Griffin Museum so you know well and in fact I was sitting right here as you were uh, reading the story for the first time and uh, if you, if I can I'd like to interpret my version of Ben Jarofsky reading that article oh, yeah, about uh, Ken Griffin <laughs> here wait, let me get some paper for the effect here here's Ben reading it oh man <laughs> oh. what the beep oh, <laughs> oh man <laughs> That was it. Uh, yeah, it pretty much sums it up. Uh, you know, well, you know, uh, money talks, everything else walks. Yeah, or, yeah man. Oh, oh, Kenny G, man. And not the sax player. The other Kenny G. He's got the museum name for him. The little kids for the next, for the next 100 years. I'm going to the Griffin Museum. Yeah, there's never going to be, like I was saying earlier, there's never going to be like a regular guy. Uh, that, like, uh, this is John the Janitor <laughs> Museum. It's no, going to be rich guys. Well, my, uh, my idea, I, this was my proposal. I threw this out there. Of course, nobody in the city listen to me <clears throat> uh, since the uh, taxpayers of the city of Chicago were largely responsible for financing Millennium Park and they were folks you were uh, my suggestion was that every day they give the park a new name for a taxpayer so today will be the Dr. D Park. Oh, all right. Cool. Tomorrow will be the Miles Conflassen Park. Uh, the next day will be Ed Maher Park. <laughs> all right. Just uh, you know, these are just some of the taxpayers who contributed. We have a lot of taxpayers in the city of Chicago. I think there's if you just count residents, there's over two million. So you know that's a lot of days. And then when you do go through the two million. <laughs> You start it all over again. I mean, I believe last Tuesday was National Cheeseburger Day, so I think we could do something like that. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I did not know that. Oh, uh, yeah, that's something like There's always a day. So anyway, uh, young uh, Kenny G uh, got his name uh, on the Museum of Science and Industry. We'll talk to Miles about that. Uh, the aforementioned Ed Maher will be here. We're talking union issues with Ed Maher from Operating Engineers Local 150. And, uh, oh, State Representative Chris Welch will be in. I, I uh, called him immediately when I saw that he proposed uh, a bill uh, that would enable college athletes to hire agents and uh, to do endorsement deals. And, you know, Dennis has a very strict pro prohibit. He prohibits a ban on sports talk on this show. Anytime I try to talk sports on this yes, show, I do. Yes, I do. the microphone goes off. Hey, how about those bulls? <laughs> Uh, but, oh wait, I have a. But anyway, so by 
talking about uh, uh, Representative Welch's bill, I get to sneak around that. Maybe I'll ask him a sports question or two. Yo, I go, Dennis, hey, bit. look over there. What's that? Dennis will be like, what? Hey, Chris, what about those bulls? Speaking of which. I'm uh, not falling for that one again. Okay. Uh, yeah, you fell for that once before. Speaking of which, I'm, I'm happy to say Joe Colley, sometimes a uh, Bulls beat writer, will be into uh, the studio next week for a bonus interview about the Bulls. So Dennis has said, all right, I'll let you talk to Cowley again uh, since the last interview that we did. I was thinking it was in July, did so well. So I'm happy to say uh, we will get a little Bulls talk. Oh, there you go. I'll, I'll allow that to happen. Yeah, we're going to have Joe Cowley, and I can't wait to talk some Bulls basketball with Joe's oh, Joe Cowley. Don't make me. Sorry. But that's not till next week. Today, we're talking politics, 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 and what else, D? Politics. Politics. And we start with the news from the young doctor from Alton. How's it going, everybody? <laughs> Having a good day? Yeah? Cool. <laughs> Not a doctor. All right. <laughs> Let's talk about what's happening in Chicago and or Illinois this afternoon. My God, he will not go away. I just biked around Lake Michigan. Former Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel is back in the news again. So long, bicycle helmet, and Lord save us all. He's got his <laughs> political pundit helmet on again. Oh, yeah. By the way, uh, that political uh, pundit helmet fresh with a sweet Joe Biden decap. <laughs> uh, just to let everybody know. Although, he'll be the first to <laughs> throw Joe off the bus if the polls fall. You watch. Uh, I, I really like uh, Elizabeth Warren. Here, I thought Ben Jarofsky was the biggest Joe Biden lover. No, no. <laughs> Mayor Rahm Emanuel. I got the tattoo. You want to see it? Oh, that is sweet. All right. Well, more on that in moments. But first, Ben, you were talking about it uh, just minutes ago. Mm -hmm. And boy, did you talk about it in your latest Chicago Reader article. We have more updates on the possible Chicago teacher strike to discuss here. Will they strike or will a deal get cut? That's been the question for about a week now. No definite answer yet, but we now have a deadline. The following comes from the Chicago Sun-Times. Chicago teachers, school support staff, and park district workers have set a joint October 17th strike deadline, giving the city and 35,000 public employees less than 15 days to hammer out deals. Leaders from the Chicago Teachers Union and Service Employees International Union Local 7-3 the union that uh, represents some school support staff and the majority of Chicago Park District workers announced the unified deadline Wednesday evening as chanting workers in red and purple shirts filled the CTUs near West Side headquarters. Here's the quote from CTU President Jesse Sharkey, quote, the mayor has a difficult choice right now. The mayor can either do what's right at the table or can face a unified strike of both CTU and SEIU together. Mayor Lori Lightfoot and Chicago Public Schools CEO Janice Jackson said in a statement Wednesday evening that the city is, quote, fully prepared for a strike and that school buildings would be kept open, quote, to ensure students have a safe and welcoming place to spend the day and warm meals to eat. Here's more from the mayor in the school chief statement. We will continue bargaining at an aggressive pace to reach a deal that is fair to our teachers and staff, supports the record-setting progress we've made, and promotes the best interests of Chicago families so that we do not have to open our school buildings without the educators and staff members who are so crucial to our district's success. CTU's Jesse Sharkey said the city made its first, quote, serious offer at the end of last week after teachers voted 94% in favor of a strike. Still, he said the school's district proposal fell short in a number of key areas, including teacher preparation time, class sizes, and how to address staffing shortage. Ben Jarofsky, what say you? We have a deadline. Are we going to uh, reach a deal or not? Well, as you know, I predicted we would uh, reach a deal in 2012 without a strike, and I was wrong. So I'm always hesitant uh, to double down on something. Uh, I, I I get the feeling that we're heading toward a strike. But you know what, D? I'm going to put out good vibrations. All right. Okay? All right. So it's like last year, and I had to predict how many games the Bulls are going to win. Oh, okay. I said they were going to win 50, and I just put that vibration out there. I think you said the Bears were going to win the Super Bowl, too. I, I, and they were going to go undefeated, yeah. and of course, they blew that right. on the opening game. Uh, Mitch Trubisky, great quarterback. Uh, anyway, uh, so no sports talk. Uh, so I'm going to put the good vibrations out. I'm going to say they're going to cut a deal. Uh, pretty much everybody I talk to who's got any way... Uh, involved in this, either on one side or the other, has, is telling me it's going to a strike. But there I am. No, D, you watch. They're going to cut a deal at the very end. I, I think I I started off talking about how confrontation is scary. I'm not a... Uh, it's 
demanding something does not come easy to me. So I can really appreciate the difficulty of what the teachers are doing. Uh, and I get nervous when somebody makes a demand that could like forces a confrontation. So uh, I'm feeling that nervousness. It's like a, it is like a sporting event when your team, you want your team to win and you realize that that other team wants to win just as bad. And someone is going to walk away with the victory and someone is going to walk away losing. That's, that's kind of the feeling I have now. Now you hope it's not like a baseball game. Like everybody can claim a little something uh, and everybody can claim a little bit of a victory and they can reach some kind of a conciliation. I don't see it coming, D. I don't see the rhetoric on either side uh, heading in that direction. And I um, I got a feeling, uh, I got a feeling that uh, there's some major concessions that Lori Lightfoot does not want to make regarding uh, staffing. She does not want to make those guarantees. I talked about that in my story. So... Even though I'm predicting just for the sake of sending out good vibrations that they'll cut a deal, very worried. <laughs> All right. By the way, if you've yet to check it out, you should. The latest Chicago Reader column from our very own Ben Jarofsky. It's titled Busted Priorities. He's talking all about the Chicago teacher strike. It's posted on the Ben Jarofsky Show Facebook page at Benny J Show and the Chicago Reader uh, website as well, chicagoreader.com. Ben, tell us uh, some of uh, the reactions you've been getting with your article from people. Well, I... Uh, <laughs> If uh, I've gotten a lot of favorable reactions for people who uh, are on the side of the teachers and the other side, hold on, let me get the knife out. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, that hurt. Uh, uh, my, my position uh, is that uh, the things that the teachers are asking for in terms of cl lower class size and uh, wraparound services, uh, nurses, uh, social workers, et cetera, are things that the city should have delivered long ago. They should have delivered them during the days of ROM. Well, I go back to daily for that matter, but definitely during the days of ROM and uh, Lori Lightfoot should have signed on to, to it early on. And the fact that the teachers are having to demand that making a strike issue out of it and go on strike to get the city to do the right thing is upsetting. And uh, so I'd like to just, I would like to put aside that the the issue of the contentious relationship between the Chicago Teachers Union and Lori Lightfoot and just concentrate on what a city, a civilized school system does on behalf of its children. And I don't believe, I believe our city is falling short. I feel our city has been falling short for years. There's tremendous inequities in the public school system. Uh, when we were talking at the hideout just the other day, uh, uh, Alderman Jeanette Taylor was talking about uh, the poor schools in her South Side neighborhoods. Uh, we have Andrea Parker, a public school teacher, came on the show, talked about 43 kids in a classroom. I just, how, how can you expect kids from a poor, low income background to keep up with kids from a well to do background when you have that kind of inequity? And the city is supposedly committed to bridging that gap. Uh, that's what every mayor says he or she wants to do. And yet when it comes to uh, dedicating our city's resources to, to trying to do that by like something basic, like more social workers or nurses or, uh, you know, an art program or drama program, they pull back and they hold off. They never have the money for that. So I think it's pretty outrageous uh, that we have not already as a city committed uh, to some of these employment goals. And that has nothing to do with the teacher strike. All right. And then there's more to this uh, story here. And because I guess this is how politics works. All right. There must be no way around this. We have now picked sides. All right. Who's on Team Lori? Who's on Team Teachers? Our host, Ben Jarofsky. Well, yay for our teachers. <laughs> yay for our teachers. As you know, he's Team Teachers. All right. But there are those out there, Rock. even among... What's so funny? Bruce Rauner doing yay for our teachers. But there are those out there, even among those of the left-leaning persuasion, who beg to differ. In fact, the following from the Illinois political bulldogs over at Illinois Politico and one Shia Kapos may have given us some insight as to why uh, some out there are on the mayor's side on all of this. According to three people close to the negotiations, there's a more sinister plot, Ben. Okay, yeah. Here's the piece from Illinois Politico. With an October 17th strike date set, Mayor Lightfoot and her negotiators are ready, come what may. They've offered up what they can uh, what they can to make a deal with the Chicago Teachers Union, but they may be realizing the CTU's beef at this point isn't really about money. It's about, now this is from Illinois Politico. It's about CTU exercising demons of the mayoral campaign, according to three sources familiar with the negotiations. Uh, the wording in this kind of screams Lightfoot spokespeople. You took the bait, Politico. <laughs> 
Uh, a year ago, the union <laughs> threw itself into the mayor's race in support of Tony Preckwinkle. CTU members uh, did field organizing, led rallies, and created some of the vitriol toward Lightfoot that exists today. CTU even gave $100,000 in member dues to Preckwinkle's sputtering campaign just days before the April runoff election. That's when Preckwinkle came out with the infamous TV ad trying to link frontrunner Lightfoot to a deadly fire in 2004. Lightfoot's victory, winning every single ward, was a blow to CTU's power and perceptions about its influence. And the union has been struggling to get some of its mojo back ever since. CTU's dilemma is that it's trying to wage a war with a mayor who's not Rahm Emanuel. An enemy CTU knew how to fight. Battling Lightfoot is challenging for the union. She's an African-American woman who came from humble beginnings. Her politics are progressive, and she shares CTU's values. They should be allies. The leadership at Chicago Public Schools has changed, too. It's now led by two African-American women who are former school teachers. But a strike may prove to be CTU's best way to demonstrate it still wields power, though CTU dismisses the notion. The union says Lightfoot, quote, ran on a platform built on her words, equity and educational justice. If she's willing to break that promise out of vindictiveness, that's just appalling, according to to a spokeswoman. All right, the article goes on. You can read it in Illinois Politico, but Benny J, we have to ask you the question. <laughs> Are the Chicago teachers working up a nefarious plot and seeking revenge uh, on the mayor for the election? Let, let me drink my Lori Kool-Aid. Mmm. I just had a delicious sip of Lori Kool-Aid. Oh, oh of course. course, whatever Politico said. Uh, first of all, I think there was a, 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 a mistake in there. They, talked, they said that two of the heads of the Chicago uh, Teachers Union are African-American. And Jesse Sharkey, the president of the Chicago Teachers Union, is a white man. Uh, I, I, not, I can't read the writer's mind, but I, she's probably alluding to uh, Stacey Davis Gates, who, by the way, will be on this show on Friday, uh, who's vice president of the union. And she is an African-American woman uh, who used to be a public school teacher here in the city of Chicago. So uh, I, there's the head of the union is a white guy, for what it's worth. Um, I. I always find it interesting that there's this assumption that because the leaders of forces uh, of like of institutions are, are black women, they're supposed to get along automatically. Uh, that, that's that's been sort of like an underlying theme in the uh, uh, coverage of the relationship between Tony Preckwinkle and Lori Lightfoot. Um, I know a lot of white women that don't get along. I know a lot of black women that don't get along. I know a lot of white men that don't, you know, this notion that just because you're each, everybody's black in this situation, they're gonna get along, kind of is disproven by like the history of the world. <laughs> so this notion that Lori Lightfoot is supposed to get along with Stacey Davis Gates and whoever that uh, other African-American woman they were uh, alluding to, uh, maybe the writer was thinking of Karen Lewis who uh, retired is no longer the head of the, uh, she's a black woman, it's no longer the head of Chicago Teachers Union. Anyway, uh, I don't, I, I never buy into that. Uh, secondly, the argument that the teachers are just hell bent on proving that they're a force in the city of Chicago uh, in the aftermath of the um, election is really sort of underestimating uh, the, the passion and the attitudes that many of the rank and file have uh, about the, about what they do as teachers and the, the need to address some of the inequities that we were talking about. If I mean, it just sort of says like, well, all teachers are just pawns in a chess game controlled by the leaders of the union who are still mad uh, about the election results. Now, D, as much as I love my beloved Chicago Teachers Union, I thought they overplayed their hand in the uh, election. I personally, as you know, and I said this in, the, in print and on the show, did not see a great difference between Tony Preckwinkle and Lori Lightfoot in terms of their past, what they brought to the table. I didn't think either of them were like true-blooded progressives who've been on the front lines. Uh, so I, I have no idea how Tony Preckwinkle will be handling this situation if she was mayor now. I don't know how the teachers would be handling it. Would the teachers, if Tony Preckwinkle were the mayor, be advocating for uh, special ed teachers, more special ed teachers or more, excuse me, more counselors and more nurses have that baked into the contract? I like to think they would. The, the writer there is suggesting that they perhaps they wouldn't. Uh, but this is a very important issue re that deals with the kids of the city of Chicago. And it's not about personalities. It's not about who won the last elections. It's all about what are we as a city going to do to make a commitment to try to help the people who are most vulnerable in our city. And I think the city has failed miserably 
uh, uh, in that f- effort. And I do believe, we talk so much about crime in the city of Chicago. I do believe there's a correlation between the inequities in our public schools and crime in the city of Chicago. So I think that's like you know, to have a total, a whole holistic approach to all this. And aside, this it shouldn't be a labor issue. The notion of fairly funding our schools should not be a labor issue. It should be something that the city is committed to completely on its own. And I think it's uh, it's unfortunate that it is a labor issue. So I I have a hard time believing that you could get 94% of teachers in the city of Chicago uh, to uh, to vote to go on strike as a, a, an aftermath of the uh, mayoral election. Um, I think I've heard many Lori Lightfoot people tell me the same thing. Uh, and I think the writer just bought that argument. And I'm, I'm not buying that argument right now. By the way, today on Mayor Lightfoot's schedule, a city hall visit for a media briefing in the morning and then at Four Seasons to give remarks at the Chicago Humanities Festival. Oh, and uh, a phone call to Illinois Politico for uh, having to put that uh, CTU piece out. Whoa. Uh, at least a text, huh? <laughs> Good story. <Yeah. laughs> at least some kind of something. Oh, my huh? God. Do you think about that, D? Are you going to go on strike? Are you going to walk just because of the your your union looked bad in the last election by endorsing a lady get lost? I mean, I, I, again, yeah, CTU overplayed its hand. We talked about that all the time in this show, you know? It, it was pretty obvious that Tony Preckle was going to lose. Why are you pouring more money behind uh, her campaign? So I think they overplayed their hand. But the notion that this is all about getting re- revenge for that election is pretty far fetched. People are putting a lot on the line, you know. Like you got mortgage payments, you got to worry about. You got yeah. rent payments, you got to worry about. It's serious stuff out there. People are going to go without paychecks. You think people are going to go without paychecks? Like, oh, yo, know, I was. We were embarrassed by Lori Lightfoot. I, I'm going to strike to show Lori Lightfoot that you know I, I'm powerful too in this town. Oh man. I it just doesn't make sense. I don't know anybody would say that. Do you know anybody? Those that, are awfully sour grapes. Do you, you know anybody? Yeah, really. You know, you know anybody in Alton is going to, I think I'll go potentially bankrupt and lose my house so I could send a point to the mayor of Alton. I mean, good God, who does that? Like, like times are hard. <laughs> People, you, you, like, it, it, it's got this notion like these wealthy teachers out there with these portfolios. Well, I'll just, you know, I'll sell my Picasso painting and uh, pay the rent and feed my family. And that I'll show Lori Lightfoot. Anyway. And just for the record, just so everybody knows, Ben, who did you vote for? I voted for Lori Lightfoot okay. twice. I voted for her in a primary, and then I voted for her in a general election. Did not vote for Tony Prankwinkle, and Tony Prankwinkle supporters been giving me grief about that ever since. Told you, Ben. Told you, Ben. How many times do I hear that, man? But I voted for Lori Lightfoot twice. Yes, indeed. Yeah, that'll uh, keep happening, by the uh, way. All right. Told you, Ben. <laughs> Can I get it from both sides? From the current mayor to the former. I just biked around Lake Michigan. Okay, enough oh, about your bike. God. Wait, how long was it, though? Yeah, how many say? miles? Nearly a thousand miles. Wow, very impressive, Rom. What an athlete. <laughs> All right. What? How a, a thousand miles? I always think it's ten thousand, but it was only a thousand. <laughs> only a thousand. Good. What is he? Uh, uh, an Olympic star or something? Ten thousand. All right. But so we all saw his television pundit performance oh, uh, during the job. debate a couple of weeks back. Uh, you know, I think progressives are really oh, where the energy this, the is way. right now. And I think if you can expand the electorate, which is what we saw in 08, bringing out new voters, particularly brown and black voters, young voters, energize the base where you don't have to change your message much, right? Just go out and get those voters excited. We can win. Oh, comes I saw you shaking your head real oh, quick. What's the rebuttal here? Well, first of all, Donald Trump is going to do a great job turning out our vote. Wow. And in 08, as well as in 92, 96, and in 12, is because both Bill Clinton and Barack Obama brought other people, not just people in the party, other people to the party. I Ben, I can't remember. What were your thoughts on that again? <laughs> that is a recipe for disaster for the Democrats if they pay. I wrote about that a couple of weeks ago. You're right. Listen to that advice. You could just hand over the White House back to Donnie Trump or Mike Pence, uh, for that matter, if Donald, young Donald has been impeached, which I doubt it's going to happen. But uh, that's a recipe for disaster. Just He's just assuming the base is going to turn out. Oh, base, turn out. Like, there you go. Like, it's that easy here in the city of Chicago. We are lucky to get 33% or 34% to show up for a mayoral election. But no, 
Oh, Donald Trump, boom, we're, we're going to double it. We're going to get 60%. Yeah, that's how it works. Well, this former mayor of ours is a multi-talented man. Oh, yeah, All right. Yeah. All right. He can ride a bike better than nobody. And uh, let's see, he's got the pundit ish the thing going on here. Uh, on the bottom of the list, by the way, being a mayor. <laughs> he wasn't a very good mayor. No. Great bike rider, though. But he's a writer as well. But, you know, he's not a very good basketball player. Remember Pat Quinn talking about that? Oh, goodness. Yeah, what, yeah. What did he say? He goes, as a basketball player, oh, Rom's a very good ballet dancer. That's my Pat Quinn imitation. <laughs> but Rom the writer has returned. Yes, uh, every now and again, Rahm Emanuel sit in his basement and <laughs> write a very stoic uh, yeah. piece. Ben, what was the last one he wrote? It was uh, involving New York, right? I can't remember. The greatest Talking about history. how the Chicago transit oh, no, system no, was no, way no, no, better no, no, no. than New that York. That wasn't the last one he wrote, but that was uh, when he was mayor. Uh, the last, I think the last one he wrote was literally about the elites of the system or taking advantage of people. But anyway, the one you're alluding to, yes, was by 2017. He was still the mayor of the city of Chicago, busy as he was running the city, all right? Busy as he was working out and riding that bike, uh, busy as he was, uh, you know, wheeling and dealing as Rom, only Rom could do. He had time to uh, write an essay for the New York Times about what New York can learn from Chicago about its public transit system. All right. Give it advice to New York. How about that? New Yorkers loved that, didn't they? And as a weekly columnist for the Chicago Reader, what uh, what did you think about his, uh, his skills there as a writer? Well, well I thought that uh, he did not write the story. The story. I, I believe his name was on the masthead. I think the only thing he wrote in that story was his name at the top of the masthead. I did not think he wrote the story, but I didn't think much of that argument. But this one, uh, you take the deep dive in there, it's just it's not bad. This this oh, one. Oh, this okay. Well, we'll get your review in a minute here. Rahm Emanuel has written in the Washington Post. Uh, no more local politics. Yeah, it turns out everybody here doesn't really care for him. He's writing national political no, national. columns. All right? <laughs> yeah, leave Chicago. Nobody <laughs> liked it. I'm smart. You're not. <laughs> Rode his bike on out of here. All right. So Rahm Emanuel writes in the Washington Post. Oh, boy. I'm going to say a name here, Ben. Now, please just hold your excitement. We have to do a show, all right? I don't want to see your buttons that you have of her. Rahm Emanuel writes in the Washington Post that House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's majority and her legacy hang in the balance. What we are about to witness is a balancing act for both parties, Rahm Emanuel writes. He continues saying Pelosi needs to move the process expeditiously, but the process needs to be seen as fair, not just fast. The charges must be clear, and the evidence needs to prove beyond any doubt that any proposed punishment fits the severity of the crime. Democrats will do themselves no favors if they fail to hold the president accountable, but they should be wary of overstepping as well. Yeah, this is Rom's advice uh, to the Democratic parties and to uh, Nancy Pelosi. Uh, and it's the it's classic uh, centrist advice. Uh, it's one that's very concerned, again, going back to that issue of how do you win an election? And uh, what Rom is very concerned that if the Democrats are too aggressive in uh, going after Donald Trump, then they will alienate swing voters who don't think the Democrats are fair. And right there and then, they're making a huge concession to Donald Trump. Donald Trump does not in any way care about playing fair. He is counterpunched. He's trashing everybody by name. We talked about, we had fun yesterday reading his Twitter, his tweets where he was, uh, uh, he was, Wait, what was the, the bullshit one yesterday? Well, hey, watch oh, your I'm not, mouth. Even, I'm not allowed Come to swear. On. You're right. My so um, I'd rather have you talk about sports. Yeah. Uh, so Donald Trump gets to play under one set of rules, but the Democrats are supposed to play under another set of rules because presumably the Democrats will lose uh, all the swing voters who are apparently, if you follow this logic, willing to tolerate uh, Donald Trump's successes excesses but would find it uh, intolerable if the democrats did anything remotely the same so a very tight parameter of what he's going to allow democrats to do uh in this upcoming impeachment inquiry or uh, that's his advice anyway in this essay no collusion you know, okay. <laughs> well we got, we got that settled <laughs> <laughs> haven't heard that one in a while 
All right, so yeah, Rom the Writer. Go read the rest of that if you want. We're done talking about it here. Uh, but not so bad, says Ben Jarofsky. Yeah, well, I still don't think he wrote it. Oh, somebody okay. else wrote oh, okay. it. Yeah. And, uh, I have, listen, I got a hard time believing any of these people write anything. Miguel DeVay, who's the current head of the uh, school board, who wrote, quote unquote, wrote an essay for the Sun Times, ran about a couple of weeks ago about the, uh, what a great job Lori Lightfoot is doing and how she's not Rom. And it was, you know, it was a well written essay. Uh, whoever wrote it did a great job. I just don't believe it was Miguel DeVay. Well, one of my favorite things back. Back when we talked about uh, Rom writing that article uh, involving uh, comparing the CTU to New York's uh, transit system. CTA, yeah. Oh, yeah, CTA. Yeah. Sorry. Got teacher strike yeah, on right, the brain. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, the Rom sitting down writing it. How, oh, yeah. how would that go? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I haven't done that bit in a while. Uh, honey, I need a word, you know, a synonym for train. What do you got for me? Ron down in the basement uh, in his underwear writing. Because like, most writers, you know, it's it's... Not a glamour. We have a writer in the room. He can tell you it's not a glamorous thing, you know. And uh, in that piece, didn't he? Comp didn't he uh, reference Mussolini? He yes, he did. The, yeah. Uh, and then, oh, that was my favorite part. That now you're bringing back memories. Uh, thank you, Miles, for that one. He said the trains run on. Time. The, he said the trains run on time, which is uh, a, a, an allusion to Mussolini, the, dic the fascist dictator from Italy. It was said of Mussolini that say what you will about Mussolini, but at least the trains run on time. So when the New York uh, people in New York were outraged by the column that Rom wrote and they said, he, they pointed out that he was comparing him uh, to Mussolini. Uh, Rom said, uh, no, uh, they were misquoting his uh, article. And then I took the time to read the article and I saw the Mussolini reference in the article, which point I concluded, not only did Rom not write this essay, he didn't read it. <laughs> <laughs> the only part he read was his by Rom Emanuel. That was his favorite part, by the way. Uh, the by Rob Emanuel. Do him uh, writing in the basement again. Mm -hmm. Honey, what's a synonym for a train? <laughs> huh? You know, because it's usually by, this is like in my family, like somebody's upstairs, somebody's downstairs. That's how we communicate. Hey! That, what was that one? He's ever in the same. Good times. Uh, you remember that one, huh, Dave? No, yeah. That went back. Up. Honey! <laughs> so there you are, the latest in what's going on in Chicago and or Illinois. Hey, Ben, you know it's uh, football season, right? Ready, set, 2020. Oh, ready, set, 2020. How are you feeling about the football season? Uh, you know what? I love my beloved Bears, but man, oh, man, oh, man. Could you guys draft a quarterback? Good God. <laughs> yeah, all right. Get Mahomes on there right now. Yeah, get Mahomes on there, guys. <laughs> But hey, podcast fans, the team at the Chicago Sun-Times, they have a new show to add to your listening lineup, especially if you're a big fan of when Ben talks about sports for about 45 seconds on this show. This football season, you can get the inside scoop on the Chicago Bears with Hallis Intrigue. Wow. The latest podcast from the Chicago Sun-Times. Tune in to hear so many Sun-Times sports reporters and Bears experts make predictions, provide insights, and analyze the day's big stories. Stay informed this football season. Listen to Hallis Intrigue at suntimes.com forward slash Hallis. And be sure to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. Check it out now at suntimes.com forward slash Hallis. Ready, set, 2020. Blue dog. What's the other ones you say? Red dog. Oh. 2020. You got to put your arms out here because you're telling the crowd, quiet, quiet. Got to call an audible, all right? Hear that? Yeah. Quiet, quiet. Ready, set, 2020. Huh, huh. Don't go anywhere. More of the Ben Jarofsky Show coming up. In fact, our good friend Miles Comp Lassen is back. He's in studio. He's sipping his coffee. He's getting pumped up. He's ready. Don't go anywhere. It's the Ben Jarofsky Show live from the Chicago Sun-Times. I just biked around Lake Michigan. Attention Chicago innovators and creators, 2019 Chicago Ideas Week is coming soon. October 12th through the 17th, this annual Ideas Festival is back, and it's the largest, most affordable Ideas Festival of its kind. They bring in hundreds of thought leaders from around the globe and some local to share ideas and spark action all across Chicago. To get a better idea of what to expect, here's a bit of audio from last year's Chicago Ideas Week with special guest and Chicago comedian Cameron Esposito. 
Everything that I have ever tried to do has had two motivations. One is I really do believe in trying to create social change. And then the other one is I'm scared and alone too. So I would like for you to join me. You know, every job that I have, I try to make sure to hold the door open. That's like my uh, motto for, for um, like, if I get through, you're coming with me. And I really, I believe in that wholeheartedly. And uh, especially if I have more privilege than you, like I'm holding the door open for you um, even wider. October 12th through the 17th, it's 2019 Chicago Ideas Week. Tickets go on sale to members on August 22nd and to general public September 10th. Once again, if you're an innovator or creator in the city of Chicago or even outside the city, you must join us for Chicago Ideas Week, October 12th through the 17th. For tickets and event information, head to chicagoideas.com. That's chicagoideas.com. And we hope to see you October 12th through the 17th for 2019 Chicago Ideas Week. Welcome back to the Ben Jarofsky Show, live from the Chicago Sun-Times. Miles Kondlassen in the studio with me, In These Times reporter, In These Times writer, also writes for Jacobin, uh, one of the few writers in the city of Chicago who is openly on the side of the Chicago Teachers Union in this dispute. I think it's safe to say, we'll get into that in a little while, what's it like to be a renegade writer uh, on the side of this teachers union when uh, so much of uh, mainstream media uh, is uh, on the other side. All right, uh, let's get an update. Uh, about Bernie Sanders, we, when we were on the air yesterday, Miles, uh, we, word was just breaking that Bernie had had an operation, and uh, I haven't seen anything new on it in a while. What's what's the latest on Bernie Sanders' uh, condition? Well, understandably, a lot of uh, people were pretty unnerved yesterday to wake up to the news. Actually, yesterday was my birthday, and uh, oh, first happy, thing I saw, oh my goodness, oh, happy, happy birthday! birthday. Okay, okay. <laughs> All right, anyway, he didn't do it for that reason. Uh, no, just to set up the dramatics of you know the first thing I saw upon waking up was oh my god, Bernie. And t honestly, for me, it brought back um, memories of. Um, Karen Lewis, when, you know, her um, health scare derailed her campaign against, you know, she was challenging uh, Rahm Emanuel, or at least had planned to. Um, of course, there's, you know, monumental differences in that that was um, brain tumor and really, a, a, you know, of course, incredibly serious. And we still send our love and prayers to Karen. But, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders had one of the most routine uh, procedures done in America, which is getting a blocked artery unclogged, basically, and getting a couple uh, heart stents put in. So, you know, this is something that happens every day in America. People, um, you know, he's 78 years old. It's pretty late in life to get this. Honestly, a lot of people get it earlier in life. Um, Bill Clinton famously had that operation in 2010. He also had like quadruple bypass. A, lo a lot of, you know, people throughout political history, Ronald Reagan had polyps removed while he was in office. You know, there's been all kinds of health issues that politicians face, but this is, you know, really, it, it could be serious, and that's why he's being uh, still looked at and, you know, has taken some time off the campaign trail, but he did announce that he will be uh, participating in the next debate, oh, which, is ask that. Yeah, yeah. which is October 15th in Ohio. So, um, two, and two nights of debates, right? right. Is I think that they actually decided to do it all at once. Oh, they've they have gone 12 to one? People. It's, I mean, wow, all right. I think the candidates are not very happy about that, understandably, because it means basically everybody's going to talk for 45 seconds, yeah. and that's it. Um, but anyway, yeah, he also you know, tweeted from the hospital about how he's, uh, you know, got great health care and very thankful for that. And it's, you know, it's apt because while this is a very common procedure, it's also very expensive in America because so many people lack health coverage. And it does fit into his... Um, campaign, you know, centerpiece of his campaign, which is this Medicare for all proposal, because it can cost over up to $40,000 to get heart stents um, put in. It's not, it's not really, an, it's not open heart surgery by any means. It's a different op operation. And Bernie Sanders did not have a heart attack. A lot of people are saying, you know, he had a heart attack. That's just not, not true. He felt chest pains. He went in and, you know, they, they did this uh, procedure on him and it happens every day. And it's exactly what should happen. You know, if you feel heart pain, you should go get it checked out and he did exactly what he should do. So um, sounds like he's going to be OK. And, you know, the problem is that the way that the media is playing this is, of course, you know, the New York Times headline was throwing doubts about his campaign, you know, with health scares. And honestly, it brings back memories of uh, 2016 and how the media treated Hillary Clinton and constantly talked about, you know, she could be on her deathbed. She's, you know, coughing. Oh, my God, what's going on with her uh, to derail her campaign? And that's just kind of how the media does it. I haven't seen 
Um, a lot of his rivals take that route, luckily. But, you know, you see columnists already in the New York Post today. There was a piece saying Elizabeth Warren is now the front runner because of Bernie's health woes, as if this is, you know, the death knell of his campaign. You know, this, as I said, this happens every day in America. It's not a uh, very serious uh, condition to have. My dad had uh, you know, uh, stents put in a number of years ago and he was healthier afterwards because, you know, you have a blocked artery, you want to get it unclogged and it actually helps with your health. Yeah. Well, I, um, I mean, obviously your dad wasn't, isn't running for president of the United States. Uh, and it, it does highlight the fact that he's 78 years old. Is that correct? Yeah. 78. Uh, we always had that trivia question here, like who's the oldest and I always fail because of dyslexia. But anyway, uh, so it, it, it does sort of put a light on, uh, what could be a problematic issue for him. And you're right, what, if you're treating this race as a horse race, uh, which is what many people do, many reporters do, then this is the the next stage in the narrative. But you, you raise something, I'm gonna get your, I don't think I've ever asked you directly this. Uh, Dennis and I are big fans, we listen to Jimmy Dore a lot. I don't know if you ever heard Jimmy Dore, he uh, has a podcast, he's definitely of left of center. And he's always castigating the mainstream media. Uh, and he feels that the mainstream media is biased uh, it particularly bias against Bernie Sanders uh, and Tulsi Gabbard is the second one, but mainly Bernie Sanders. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this is one of his favorite themes. Uh, do you share his sense that the mainstream media has a bias against Bernie Sanders? Well, I think that the interests of when you see, you know, commentators on MSNBC, as we saw um, last week, you know, MSNBC, the supposedly progressive network i mean i think there's great journalists there's folks like chris hayes that are on msnbc but then you know they had uh last week a woman on who her, her advice was you know if you're if you're supporting sanders over warren at this point in the primary basically your sexism is showing is what you know what she said and the people with her and this is somebody who's she's the uh, daughter of a mogul who's you know uh, has millions of dollars invested in the healthcare industry so i think like you know, when you have analysts on that are also very attached to the same interests that are being threatened by the candidacy of um, Bernie Sanders, of somebody who's running explicitly on trying to, um, as you saw from his proposal most recently about limiting CEO pay, he wants to, you know, take money away from some of the richest people in America. And when those people are the same and their kids are the same people that are on TV, on the networks that are in mainstream media, um, I think it's clear that there is a bias and most people don't recognize that. I mean, that's my problem with so much, you know, in the journalism sphere is that people act as if everybody is objective, even when, you know, there's clearly interests at play and being more honest about those, I think is a better way to uh, approach the field of journalism, talk about what your beliefs are, what your impulses are, what your background is, and how that might, you know, influence your reporting. So as not to feign objectivity just in the interest of, you know, trying to say you don't have a political bias because the Lord knows the folks on mainstream media do. Well, let's just uh, jump to the point I was going to raise uh, later in this interview. Let's do it right now. Uh, when you write an article or an essay that uh, champions the, the Chicago Teachers Union, let's say, in this current struggle, uh, do you feel like you're isolated in this town in terms of the, the media? Well, I don't expect that you know, my position is going to be reflected by the same people that are, you know, have different um, political goals, which are essentially to, you know, make sure that there's not a militant teachers union in this town and in this uh, country, really. That That's the, the, the reason that I think it's important to report from um, the perspective of teachers, specifically in this contract fight, is that those voices are so rarely in mainstream media. You know, that's not what you hear. You hear the voices of the school board. You hear the voices of the mayor. Um, and it's outsized. And that gives, uh, that's not the, you know, the majority of people in the city are working class people. They're, they're more like the teachers. They're the people that are dealing with um, understaffing and under-resourcing and low pay and all of the same things that the teachers are talking about and fighting for. They're not, you know, they don't have the same interests as the columnists at most of the big uh, papers in town or the anchors at, mo at most of the stations. So I think it's important to provide that perspective. It's not just that I'm, you know, always pro-teacher union necessarily. I mean, I think that it's important to have teachers unions that are strong and fighting, but I'll also call out a labor movement where there's, you know, corruption or there's, you know, issues um, pertaining to that. I mean, one of the things we do it in these times a lot is try to push unions on 
uh, environmental issues, particularly because that's one issue where there's been kind of a rift is between the climate movement and the labor movement. We want to you know bring that together. So I think it's important to have that perspective and not be blindly following any kind of organization or any kind of people. But when you talk about the teachers union fight, I don't know how you can do it without talking about what the teachers are actually fighting for, which is for better resources in the classroom. It's not about pay, you know, like that's not the issues that are being bargained over right now. What they're trying to do is get nurses, librarians, counselors into the classrooms and to uh, um, have lower class sizes to create better learning conditions for the students. So I think that that perspective is not in enough of our coverage. And that's why I think it's important to provide that. Yeah. I also like to point out strategically, and I talked about this in yesterday's story. Uh, it's, there's a, uh, a provision in state law. I'm not making this up a provision in state law, uh, that prevents teachers in the city of Chicago from striking over issues like class size yeah. and over issues like wraparound employees, how many nurses we have, etc. But they are allowed to, uh, 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 strike over pay. So I think that it's a, it's been a tactical move by Lori Lightfoot and her negotiators, a very shrewd one, to put so much concentration and so much focus and so much attention on the issue of pay. And then that gets columns like you have, uh, editorials like you have in today's tribunal, where they're saying, uh, teach, don't cave in, you've got, offered them enough. Lori knows that the teachers, it would be illegal if they go on strike, if that's a if they go on strike and they proclaim like let's say class size, which yeah. is something that I think most people would agree, you need lower class size to have better educational opportunities. Yeah. If they go on strike for that reason, they could be exposing themselves to a, a lawsuit, injunction, fines, maybe even throwing a the leaders into jail. I mean, those things have been known to happen in strikes. So it's a very shrewd tactic that Lori likes. Well, it's, it's, it's a page out of Rahm's playbook. It's the same thing that he did in 2012. You know, he said that these are greedy teachers and we need to, um, you know, paid and tried to create a rift with the public. And, you know, in 2012, it didn't work. The public was overwhelmingly on the side of the teachers. And after that strike, you know, got into motion, you started to see people's perspective change, including elected leaders, including, you know, media types. Once they saw that, you know, the people on the ground in the city of Chicago, you know, you couldn't get on a, a bus wearing red and, you know, that week in uh, 2012 without getting cheers, people were, you know, excited about supporting um, a working class movement that they thought was representing, you know, the values of working people. And I think that that a similar dynamic is most likely going to play out if this strike happens. And, you know, what the CTU has always said is that they're fighting for the school, the school Chicago's children deserve. And that's, you know, that can include better pay for teachers because teachers should be compensated for their work, especially because, you know, you, your work day doesn't end when you leave the classroom. As anybody knows, you know, you go home and you write lesson plans, you grade, you do curriculums, all this stuff. Um, I, you know, I do have a mom, uh, my mom was also a, a former CPS teacher. Um, I went to CPS schools. Uh, I think, you know, it's not just that I have a stake in this fight. I have perspective because I've, you know, been around it and I see that how this uh, school system is run and how it could be run better. I mean, if you look, he, we talked about this before, but there's a former teacher from CPS who moved to the suburbs and wrote an article about why it's so important to get uh, resources for the classroom because she moved to the suburbs and there's a librarian in her school every day. You know, there's a nurse in the school every day. That should be the standard. And that's, you know, the, some of the most pressing issues here. No, I, th and I also think to your point, uh, the fact that you have inequities and you compare Chicago to the suburbs, and this is a larger issue uh, than this teacher strike, but the, the fact that we depend on the property tax, to uh, by and large finance public education means that we have this like this gated community attitude. Follow me on this. So you go to a suburb and the suburb is financing through a property tax of people who could afford to pay it. Uh, a decent school system like in New Trier or Oak Park or wherever this teacher went. Uh, in the city of Chicago, it's a lot harder uh, to raise that amount of money from yeah. your property tax payers, because as you said, we're working class in a poor city by and large, and we the property tax is kind of a regressive tax, mm -hmm. particularly if you play the system, as so many people do yeah. play play the system uh, to work in their advantage, and those wealthier people that do you. So you're absolutely correct. Everything we do about education, public education, uh, just enforces, uh, reinforces these inequities, and here the teachers are are fighting over this and. You, you, 
you, you got like the leading voices of editorial Chicago saying, shut up and get in line and take what And it is very frustrating. Yeah, well, and I see. think it goes, you know, back to what we started talking about. The, the reason that Bernie Sanders came to Chicago uh, a couple weeks ago was to support the Chicago teachers in their fight and not just the Chicago Teachers Union, also SEIU Local 73 that's also on the verge of a strike. We now have a strike date. It's going to be October 17th if they do go through with it. I mean, of course, a strike threat is always an important part of negotiations because it puts things in perspective. I mean, this is going to be a walkout. And what happened um, back in 2012 is that a lot of the support staff was able to watch the students or the Chicago Park District. That all, They are also on the verge of a strike. So it's really going to put pressure on the um, city to negotiate and meet some of these demands of the teachers. And getting back to Bernie Sanders, I just would say that, like, you know, the reason people might say it was, you know, uh, just a shrewd campaign move to tweet from his from the hospital and say Medicare for all. But it really is, you know, the U.S., we pay six times more than what people in Europe pay for this operation around around stents. And in sadly, in America, uh, almost a quarter of people just don't even go to get seen by a doctor because they know they can't afford it. And the ones that do, over 40% of people, they refuse some type of care because they can't afford it. That means that we're not, you know, providing actual health care to Americans. That's, you know, should be the basic function of the government. And Bernie was able to take advantage of it because he's got a good health care plan because he's a senator, <laughs> yeah. you know. I know. It's uh, it, it's sort of ironic, painfully ironic there. Uh, I, Actually, before we move on here, I'm noticing something about you two fellers today. The purple. We're in the oh, purple. We're rocking it. Looking good, we, matching today. So oh, that is purple. We got a little yeah. purple. Oh, that's okay. purple-ish. If you're watching on the live stream, look at these two. Did, they, did you guys plan this? Well, no, it's not as much we're as Wildcat fans, I was. I uh, yeah, I have a big. Uh, Chris Welch will be here, by the way, at two thirty. State Representative Chris Welch, huge Northwestern Wildcat fan. Uh, I wore this same shirt when I had Alden Lowry on. Remember that day? Oh yeah, uh, yeah Back yeah. in June, and he was wearing pretty much the same type literally the same shirt color mm -hmm. so i i don't even i'm, I'm kind of colorblind so i'm i wouldn't even recognize that as purple but this, is, so. this has been this has been mistaken the shirt as for a drug rug which is what the kids call you know those kind <laughs> of pullover uh um like woven shirts a lot of the Wait, the hippie types wear them. This, to be clear, this is a button-up shirt. It's oh, not a drug rug. The kids call them. You're like a kid to me, all right? The kids call oh, the younger well, generation. Let's, let's, let's solve it here by the end of Miles' segment here. Let's go to the YouTube live stream chat here and find out who wore it better. All right, let's get a look here. If you're watching on the live stream, you're getting an extra dose here of the show. Sorry, downloaders. <laughs> First, let's look at Miles. Look at that shirt he is wearing there, buttoned down. And you know, yeah, I'm, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm 34 now, so I'm technically I'm in my mid 30s. So okay. I'm, I can't say I'm quite a kid. Anymore. I'm still a young man. <laughs> Everyone's a kid to Ben. Good yeah. lord, he's old. But look at this button down <laughs> shirt here that he's wearing. Very yeah. nice, very nice. And then we go to Ben Jarofsky with a nice polo mm. shirt that I've seen him wear quite a bit. I like I, this shirt. I work with the everyday. Hey, so, what's you the know, matter with this shirt? Very nice polo shirt yeah, there. Yeah. Purple polo well, shirt. I always like to look good because I know we have the live stream. Yeah, here, we have so. the live stream. Who, yeah, now we're going to the live stream. <laughs> Who wore it better? Ben Jarofsky or Miles Compflas? And we'll find out before the segment ends. Uh, the winner gets a blue Mustang. No one wins anything. Uh, all right. So let's keep it local and talk about something that you, you broke this story to me. <laughs> uh, since I'm on a newspaper I get my news from the newspaper, so it's a 24-hour cycle. I missed the, the story broke in the last couple hours. Uh, that Ken Griffin, the hedge fund gazillionaire, uh, one of the richest men, I think he is the richest man in Illinois, yeah. these homes all over the world or over the country, uh, gave, I think, $125 million to the, the Museum of Science industry, and as a result, it is now... Uh, the Kenny G, oh, I'm the only one who calls him Kenny G, but the Ken Griffin Museum of Science and Industry, and uh, that just blew my mind. I mean, how could you, I, I can't even get the words out. It's the Museum of Science and Industry. How could you buy the Museum of Science and, how could that possibly be? I mean, why not just make a donation to it? You, you, you're worth gazillions of dollars, right? Just It's not even as much as he paid for a you know, he paid almost two hundred and sixty million dollars for uh, for a he, penthouse in New he York. He paid more money for yeah. the penthouse. Yeah. Did they name the penthouse after him? <laughs> Who knows? Did what they he name the building, the, the Kenny G building? It just goes to show that you know this is. I think the the era we're living in. You know, there's such extreme wealth. You know, this uh, census data just came out last week showing that the inequality levels are at the highest point in at least 50 years. The, you know, the Gini coefficient, the, you know, point between the 
um, richest and lowest in the in America in in the United States. And so the with such extreme levels of wealth, obviously these people can't spend all that money in like a million lifetimes. Mm-hmm. So what do they do? They try to you know live eternally through these basic things and throwing their names on. Um, what should be really public goods is a, a museum should not be, you know, a, a heir to a, some rich guy who bankrolled Bruce Rauner and helped to, you know, cut social services across the state of Illinois and wreaked so much havoc and pain on um, poor and working class people across the state. Now his name is on, you know, a museum that is, you know, all these students are going to from across the Chicago area it's really sad and what you see as well is you know what what happened recently is this lawsuits against the sackler family they're you know had um pushed basically opioids on americans for for years and now we have this massive opioid crisis so the sackler family came under pressure to um face some consequences for this and as a result they had their names pulled off of all these university buildings that they had um, put money uh, into, you'd think that that would humble some of these rich guys a little bit and they'd think, oh, maybe I shouldn't put my name on stuff because it, you, while it may be exciting to get your, uh, name on it, think about how bad it is to get it ripped off. You well, know? there was an attitude that was existed in, in the city when I first moved here way back when that the school system would not sign on to naming a school after somebody who was alive. And the, the wisdom was, the, uh, the reasoning was, the logic was that if they do something embarrassing, they get caught up in something that would discredit the name, yeah. they, the school would not want to be connected to that person. And um, I actually think it was first challenged when it was a Pritzker, one of the Pritzkers got a school uh, in Wicker Park, the Pritzker School on Damon named for him. Uh, this is long this is many many years ago so that was the kind of the logic that governed and so the real question is why would the museum of science and industry want to have a name on its building you know what i'm saying like this is also this is an iconic building i mean this is the last remnant we really have of the white city of the columban exposition um world fair in chicago you know this is one of the treasures of chicago now is going to have Ken Griffin's name plastered on it and you know be, forever uh, and ever uh and I don't know for 125 million I mean 125 million that man that seems like a reasonable price for Kenny G and it's just going into the endowment it's not as if you know we, we've seen you know things like this before Stefan Edlis uh you know famously gave a massive donation to the Art Institute and that is now permanent exhibit in the modern wing they didn't rename the art Institute, Institute of chicago yeah. the step and well, now i'm thinking through there's the shed aquarium uh, but i presume that the the john shed the money came when they constructed it it wasn't already around as uh at whereas the museum of science industry has been the museum of science industry for for freaking ever yeah. uh, since the 30s or whenever it was uh, created so uh when i when i saw this story i was like oh no man and then it's like me trying to keep up with the ever-changing name of sears tower yeah. and i'm still calling it sears tower I'm like some yeah. old guy of course i have a hard time with the you know i still call the united center of the chicago stadium i have my issues uh miles oh and comiskey park of course Call we're comiskey. not we're not calling it guaranteed rate who calls it guaranteed rate is anybody in chicago call it guaranteed rate? Uh, i don't know field? but i remember when uh jerry reinsdorf the owner of the white Sox, announced the deal he said fans you can call whatever you want you can call comiskey park <laughs> you could call sell your field you, whatever you want to call it just come to the games can we uh, also i know we don't like to talk sports but you know the the, the white Sox and the cubs both finished third and the White Sox you know were in a rebuilding year and the Cubs thought they were going to win the World Series I think we got to give a little shout out to our Chicago White Sox I think that's I think that Tim Anderson just out of nowhere Uh, I think that's the Beverly in that young man speaking (laughs) the Southwest Sider and him speaking yes uh my beloved Chicago White Sox they finished third at with I think they won 74 games and lost 88 mm-hmm. which is not exactly a triumphant third place finish I'm looking at Ed Meyer he's a White Sox <laughs> fan I think all right well uh, before we got to find out our results here of who wore it better oh, the yeah. live stream oh, okay. has weighed in <laughs> guys if you're if you just download it and you can't see apparently it's purple day on the Ben Jarofsky show both Miles and Ben wearing is that excellent purple? that is purple there's right. purple in here it's, we got we got all multiple right, colors right, without right. a out. It's purple. Okay. Miles with his nice purple button down. Ben Jarofsky, yeah, with that purple polo <laughs> he wears all the time. Wh- who wore it better? All right, the results are in. 
And no surprise, Ben, you lost. Oh, okay. <laughs> what else is no? Okay. Dragon Slayer 19 <laughs> says, love that name. Not Dragon Slayer 18 or 20. This is Dragon Slayer 19 uh. says, sorry, Miles wins this round. Steven says, yeah, got to give it to Miles. Steven, <laughs> Steven then says, love those stripes. Very becoming. Wow. And then Steven says, wow, Benny J in a solid color polo. Whoa. <laughs> Yeah, what can I do? You gotta do this more often. Yeah, okay. A little <laughs> right, ego two, boost here. To, uh, <laughs> yeah, you, the, the only person you're better dressed of in the world is me. <laughs> I gotta tell you that. Oh, and talk about an ego boost. Steven says also Miles has a cool haircut. Oh, uh, thank yes, you. he does. Uh, a very well dressed guest is on deck, deck ready to come on. Ed Meyer. And he's wearing very, orange. Is that orange? Is that orange? Sort of okay. rust color. Right. Suddenly you're like Mr. Color. Anyway, Miles, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, we'll be Miles. We're doing a bonus feature. We'll talk about that later uh, at the end of the show. So Miles will be back tomorrow. He's doing double time of the show uh, this week. Appreciate it, Miles Conflas. You can read him in these times. And Jacobin Ed Maher on deck. We'll be right back after this. You mentioned Steve King, the president, correct me if I'm wrong, has not condemned Steve King. I, uh, he said, he said praising white supremacy. Has the president publicly come out and said anything I, to I speak on behalf of the president on a number of topics, and I've talked about that a number of times, and I'd refer you back to those comments where I used words like abhorrent uh, and unacceptable. It's Chicagoland's adult entertainment playground. It's the world famous Admiral Theater. 3940 West Lawrence Avenue. The Admiral is homegrown from Chicago, and it's the most conveniently located club in all of the city. 15 minutes from the O'Hare Airport in downtown Chicago Loop. Voted Chicago's best strip club, the Admiral has showgirls galore and a variety of adult entertainment shows. The world-famous Admiral Theater. Open every day from 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. 3940 West Lawrence Avenue. For events, showtime, and other information, visit AdmiralX.com. Must be 18 years of age or older to enter. Did you know that 40% of the people in Illinois opt to be cremated? Well, it's true. And Chicagoland Cremation Options honors their wishes by providing cremation services directly to the general public. Chicagoland Cremation Options provides an affordable, ethical, and easy cremation arrangement, whether in person or online. Save thousands and streamline the process by going directly to Chicagoland Cremation Options. It's a family-owned business operated by my good friend, Douglas Klein. Here's how you reach them. ChicagolandCremationOptions.com. One more time. ChicagolandCremationOptions.com. Today's Ben Jaromsky Show was brought to you in part by Chicago Architecture Center. See the city from a whole new angle on a Chicago Architecture Center tour. With more than 85 tours to choose from, there are endless stories to discover. Book your tour at architecture.org slash tours. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm on a tour. Oh my, what magnificent architecture. Get a special discount for Illinois residents from July 15th to August 15th. All Illinois residents get 50% off select walking tours. Visit architecture.org slash IL dash resident. Hey everybody, what you're about to hear are the piano stylings of Jeff Manuel. Man, listen to Jeff go. Jeff Manuel has been playing piano around Chicago for years. He's played for conventions, for celebrities, played in basement bars with blues bands. He's played at prestigious social clubs, fine restaurants, and in the intimacy of private homes. Book Jeff Manuel at jeffemanuelpianist.com. Don't worry, I'll spell his name at the end of this commercial. You know what Chicago Magazine said? They said that Jeff Manuel is, quote, as comfortable with Chopin as he is with Cole Porter. He's excellent and his performance is joyous. He offers an elegant stream of compositions and interpretations that entertains the mind but won't hurt the ears. To hear more of Jeff Manuel's work and to book Jeff for your next event, go to jeffmanuelpianist.com. I'm going to spell it out for you people. J E F F M is in Mary, A, N is in Nancy, U, E, L, P, I, A, N, I, S, T, dot com. Take it away, Jeff Manuel.
this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Hour number two of your Ben Jarofsky show for Thursday, October 3rd is moments away. But before we get into that, we need to thank the following unions once again for jumping on board and sponsoring this program. First up, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 9, the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, Local 126 and District 8, not Aerosmith, and the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 150. Big thank you to those unions for jumping on board and helping bring back our program. And of course, today's Ben Jarofsky show is brought to you by our good friends at the Chicago Federation of Labor. Hour number two, let's go. It is Thursday, October 3rd, and live from the Chicago Sun-Times Chicago Reader Studio on Racine Avenue, this is The Ben Jarofsky Show. In this hour of the program, we welcome back union man Ed Maher, and it's The Ben Jarofsky Show debut of state rep Chris Welch. And now your host... Chicago Reader columnist Ben Jarofsky. Ed Maher in the studio looking very dapper in a shirt of some color. I don't know what it is. I'm colorblind. Uh, Let's just call it purple. We'll go with the theme. We'll go with purple. All right. All right. <laughs> uh, do you have an update for us, young man, before I jump right in with Ed? Who wore it better? Ed Maher or Ben? <laughs> no, I don't have an update. <laughs> all right. Thank you. And I'm losing. Now I can drop it again. I happen to like this shirt a lot. But it's, it's a great a very, shirt. It's a really nice shirt. Thank you, Ed. I appreciate it. You wear it that. when you play polo? <laughs> <laughs> I was just curious. I was playing polo yesterday, as a matter of fact. Four? Is that what you say in polo? Or is that I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know. That's golf, actually. Uh, uh, four. Uh, all right, Ed, let's start. Uh, before we get down to uh, the news of the day, let's get an update on the apprenticeship program. We wanted to talk about it, get uh, in, interested applicants. Uh, give folks uh, the 101 on this. Yeah, so um, the Operating Engineers Local 150, again, we're the union around northern Illinois, northern Indiana, southeastern Iowa that represents all the heavy equipment operators that you see on construction sites, whether it's cranes or dozers or um, steamrollers. We also represent the folks who maintain and repair that equipment, um, you know, and uh, well drillers, various other uh, professions. But we're opening up uh, applications for our apprenticeship program. There was a lot of years where we hadn't done it at all because work was kind of so bad when the economy was down. But um, in the month of November, we're going to be holding various different events where we, um, where we distribute applications. And the interest on this is always very high. The last couple of years, we've had 5,000 applicants uh, each time. It's, uh, it's very competitive, but a lot of folks are, are interested in these jobs because as an apprentice, you don't pay anything. You go to training for around three years. If you, um, if you, go to, you, know, if you, if you graduate quickly, if you graduate on schedule, you're in there for about three years. Um, you're earning money the entire time. There's no tuition, and you're picking up skills that will last you for an entire career. And your pay is going up every six months as you're going through the program. And then when you become a journeyman, uh, journey worker, I should say, um, you know, you've got uh, full health care benefits, full retirement benefits. Um, you know, you're contributing to a couple of different retirement funds. And uh, you always have the opportunity to go back for more training. So these are high skill, um, you know, very nicely paying jobs in the construction industry. And uh, so in the month of November, we're going to be opening up the applications. We'll have different events. We've got a calendar. It's available at www.local150.org. So folks can go there, see the different dates um, that will be, you know, we've got offices throughout our jurisdiction, which again goes, again, goes from, you know, the Quad Cities to South Bend, pretty much, and across the, um, you know, basically along I-80 and a little bit north of there, um, or fully north of there across the state of Illinois. So um, check that out, local150.org. We're looking for we're looking for people. It's been a really busy couple of years in the construction industry. There's a lot of work to be done. As you know, the state of Illinois just passed this um, this highway bill. Indiana passed one about two years prior. So there's going to be a lot of work going on. We need the the most talented, skilled you know, young men and women that we can find to get out there and do it. So check us out. And, um, you know, we've got room for everybody. You know, it doesn't matter if you're man or woman, four feet tall, seven feet tall. We got a spot for you. All right. And what was the... Uh, the... It's uh, local150.org. All right. We'll close off uh, with repeating that information uh, for folks if they're interested and want to apply. Uh, let's move on to talk about uh, a poll I, sh I saw about uh, union support is on the uptick, which is 
uh, leads into sort of the topics that are on my mind in general here in the city of Chicago, where there's uh, so many uh, labor battles uh, breaking out uh, all around us. I think I could, off the top of my head, Ed, I think I can think of five. Uh, but before I enumerate, talk about this poll uh, and, and the, the results. Sure. Every year, Gallup uh, polling puts out a study um, where they ask, you know, across the country, across party lines, age demographic lines, what people's um, opinion on unions is. And they've been doing, the, doing this ever since the 30s, back in the early days of the American labor movement. And this year they found that uh, they just released the numbers um, a couple of weeks ago. And across the country, about 62% of Americans approve of unions, which is the highest that that number has been since 2003. Um, as you know, you know, the 50s were the high point of union membership in this country, where about half of, half of American workers belong to a union. Now that number is down closer to 11% nationwide. Um, but I think that, um, you know, the support among younger people is growing for unions because these are folks that are getting out of college with um, massive debt burdens because of their student loans. There are fewer job opportunities, and employers, frankly, have taken advantage of, of the hunger for work um, from these young people for, uh, by, by making these jobs a little bit less um, less than they really should be. They pay less. The benefits are almost non-existent. You know, so many people are going to the, you know, the gig economy where they're temps or contractors or, you know, just kind of uh, independent people like the Ubers or, or any of these different consulting gigs. So by um, changing rules within the National Labor Relations Board that uh, weaken workers' abilities not only to, to form a union, but to continue to stay in a union. Um, and then through the appointments. You know, he's had a kind of a, an interesting revolving door of appointees for this job. First, there was Andy Puzder, the guy, uh, the head of Hardy's Foods, who there were some allegations of him you know, abusing his spouse or uh, an old girlfriend, or I'm not, I'm, I can't remember exactly the details, but he got yanked. And then there was Acosta who um, gave a uh, kind of a sweetheart deal to the late Jeffrey Epstein. And now you've got um, Scalia, and he's part of this society um, of judges that is um, extremely right wing. And, uh, you know, his, his history working uh he was the he was a, a general counsel i think of um the department of labor under george w bush mm -hmm. and his legacy there is relaxing rules and changing definitions and fighting the classifications of what could be considered a workplace injury so things like carpal tunnel syndrome um you know it was his position he fought very hard to say that carpal tunnel syndrome was just a coincidence that it was not you know the a condition that was caused by sitting at a keyboard for 30 years so the, the reality of that is you can have a job using a jackhammer for 25 years or 30 years, and when you go to retire, you've got nerve damage, uh, and you have a federal government that would say, well, that's, that's just a coincidence. You th oh, there's no tie. That's just coincidence. Oh, there's no tie to you using a jackhammer for eight hours a day for 30 years and having uh, you know, nerve damage in your arms now. Um, so it's just it's another finger on the scale in favor of the employers. Um, you know, I think all we can hope for, all anybody can hope for in this country is a fair shot. Mm -hmm. You know, a fair government where if you've, got a, if you've got an agency like the Department of Labor that was created to balance the power between employers and workers, not tilt it in one way or the other, just keep it balanced. Um, I mean, uh, so much is being put on the scale both from the Supreme Court and from um, the Department of Labor and the National, National uh, Labor Relations Board that it's just looking bleaker and bleaker. And the sad thing is, of course, that um, Donald Trump got considerable support in his, uh, you know, for, uh, we've, Local 150 has a lot of members that voted for him and still talk about it. And, you know, talking about the things that he's done to weaken them or to put the union, put their, their futures on shaky ground, it's getting into the weeds because so much of it is regulatory. It's through court cases and, you know, Folks who, uh, who, who work every day might not want to have a conversation about court cases. Some of them do, some of them don't. But it's, it's difficult to explain. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm, uh, another, 
another four years would be pretty had pretty detrimental to workers because the things that have been d- done so far, um, the court cases that have been done, the regulations that have been changed, they're going to take decades to undo. And and further, I think folks that that uh, you know had a solid background in policy in these labor um, agencies have left government. You know, a lot of people have just said, okay, this is this is not what this is supposed to be about. I'm out of here. So you've got agencies being run by, you know, former third or fourth or fifth level staffers, um, and there's just not a lot of good work going on. So the, the damage that's being done is going to take a long time to occur. Um, and the word on the street, you know, increasingly is that uh, Scalia is being put in to, um, you know, get a little bit of time under his belt until there's another Supreme Court oh vacancy. My. Wow! So if Clarence Thomas were to to yeah. to finish his uh, his term on the court, you know, you might see he's uh, next in line. And the Scalia name is, too. Scalia, of course, he's the son of Anton Scalia, the uh, yeah. uh, right wing uh, Supreme Court justice for many many years. Uh, to the point you just made, there was an article in the Tribune last week. I don't know if you saw it. Uh, Bill Ruthart the, was the writer, did a good job. I thought he went to Michigan and was interviewing striking uh, GM workers, Mm -hmm. UAW members, and was uh, pointing out that many of them were openly uh, supportive of Donald Trump. And I'm reading this with just an increasing sense of disbelief. The attitude they had uh, expressed was they didn't care that Donald Trump wasn't on the front lines with them. And they didn't, they did, they were support, they kind of like Bernie, but they just viewed, well, Democrats have to support us. So we just assume that they're going to support us. Mm -hmm. And they gave Donald Trump a pass. It's really hard to build a labor movement politically. Do you follow what I'm saying, Ed? For sure. Uh, When you got, there's no consequences for a politician giving the middle finger to union members. Well, when it comes to, and this, this is, it's so unique because it used to be more of a fight between, um, especially in building trades organizations, you've got Democrats that are supposed to be for unions and Republicans that are supposed to be for guns. And basically it was a choice for workers, whether you valued your job more or your guns, I would say, you know, you do need a job to be able to buy guns. Um, but with Donald Trump, I mean, it doesn't, there's no sense to it. Uh, You can say one thing today, one thing tomorrow. Like for example, let's talk about, uh, let's talk about the stock market. If the stock market or the unemployment rate, um, you know, improves, he takes credit. If it goes bad, he blames the Federal Reserve and calls, um, God, I can't remember what he called the Federal Reserve chair. Um, I don't know. It couldn't have been good. It wasn't good. (laughs) It wasn't good, but it's just (laughs) insane. That's a good point, though, yeah. Um, So it's, uh, it's a matter of him playing the blame game for anything that's going wrong in any industry. And then when it comes back and something good happens, you know, he, he likes to wrap, wrap it around himself. And, you know, frankly, a lot of people across the country, whether it's in the coal industry or the auto industry, he'll send out a tweet saying, we've got to keep these jobs here. And it's like that signifies his support for those workers, whereas the policies and the actions that he's taking behind the scenes are really what matters. And that is the support there is is nowhere near as strong. Well, let me uh, ask you to weigh in in this discussion we've had a lot of, not just today, but for the last couple of weeks. uh, There's a concern on part of some Democratic strategists uh, that if the Democrats push too hard on impeachment, they'll lose the support of swing voters in key states like Michigan, uh, where the strikers, uh, the UAW workers are on strike. Uh, What's your view of this? You know, I don't know... um You've, you've got to have a really strong case to to go in and do this because I think that whether it's the Kavanaugh hearing or the aftermath of the Mueller testimony, facts don't actually really matter. Um, you know, it's it, it all just gets spun. So if you walk in there with anything less than a smoking gun, it's it is going to be a challenge. I mean, and and that's terrible because what's being done and what's been done, you know, you could look at some of the things that that Nixon did. And does this rise to levels above that? A lot of people think that it does. So I think that at some point you've got to take a stand. So I don't disagree with what's with what's happening. But at the same time, would would an impeachment trial in the Senate just give Senate Republicans the opportunity to run the spin machine on national news and trash Joe Biden and Hunter Biden? And, you know, the, the way they're going after him. They have to believe that he's the strongest threat to Donald oh, Trump. There's no question they believe that. And so yeah. does does an impeachment trial just give them 
the the stage to destroy their, you know the, the greatest opponent that they've got in this election currently like arguably let's mm-hmm. say um, I don't know it's a very risky thing but at the same time what are we gonna do nothing uh, at some point there's got to be some kind of accountability and this guy's losing his mind over yeah, it. it's obviously got him yeah. pretty twisted up so <laughs> yeah I know his the press conference yesterday uh, I, I don't know if you saw it. Yeah, how I, bad did that guy look like he wanted to get out of there? He's looking like... The, fin- uh, the Finnish president? Yeah, is the yeah. car ready? <laughs> Donald Trump yelling at some reporter, you know, ask the Finnish president the question. I think, <laughs> man, our president is losing his mind. Yeah, well, hopefully he'll be the finished president before too long. Oh, Ed Barr's got like that? Yeah, yeah I like you. that. Uh, Chris Welch is on deck. We're going to bring him on really soon. Ed, before I let you go, one more time, give folks the information on the apprenticeship program. It's uh, the You can find more information at local150.org, um, but it's a, a four-year program. You can learn how to operate heavy equipment in a construction site and uh, you know live a, live a good life while you're doing it, making you know good wages, earning retirement benefits, health care, um, you know, and, and really world-class training. So uh, it's a great opportunity. We hope you'll take a look at it and, um, you know, come out to one of our application events in the month of November. Right. That's correct. That is correct. Robert Mueller agrees with you. Very good. And uh, Ed Maher, thank you very much. Uh, always fun to have you on the show. Good friend of the Ben Jarofsky Show for a, a long, long time. I could tell you that one uh, from my heart, Ed Maher. Uh, Chris Welch is on deck. We're going to bring him on when we return. Are you forgetting what you said two minutes ago? Being for Are you forgetting already what you said just two minutes ago? I mean, I can't believe that you said two minutes ago that they had to buy in, and now you're saying they don't have to buy. You're forgetting that. I said anyone I mean, like look, your grandmother who look, has no money, we need she a healthcare system. You're automatically enrolled. Automatically enroll. enrolls people, regardless of whether they choose to opt in or not. If you lose your job, for instance, his his healthcare plan would not automatically enroll you. You would have to opt in. My healthcare plan would. That's a big difference. I'm fulfilling the, fulfilling the legacy of Barack Obama, and you're not. I'll be surprised to hear. Attention Chicago innovators and creators, 2019 Chicago Ideas Week is coming soon. October 12th through the 17th, this annual Ideas Festival is back, and it's the largest, most affordable Ideas Festival of its kind. They bring in hundreds of thought leaders from around the globe and some local to share ideas and spark action all across Chicago. To get a better idea of what to expect, here's a bit of audio from last year's Chicago Ideas Week with special guest and Chicago comedian Hannibal Burris. The real reason I came home is just because I was traveling I a lot anyway. I wasn't in New York that much, and I don't have a full-time job in New York. I work a lot, but I'm not in New York, so it was just like, I don't, I don't need to be here anymore. And, I, and also, I just wanted to work on different stuff here in Chicago, so I have this center that I'm working on on the west side, Melvina Masterminds. It's going to be arts and, and then a tech program and after-school programming for uh, kids in the, in the North Austin area. So. Just wanted to be back. There we go. October 12th through the 17th, it's 2019 Chicago Ideas Week. Tickets go on sale to members on August 22nd and to general public September 10th. Once again, if you're an innovator or creator in the city of Chicago or even outside the city, you must join us for Chicago Ideas Week, October 12th through the 17th. For tickets and event information, head to chicagoideas.com. That's chicagoideas.com. And we hope to see you October 12th through the 17th Today's Ben Jaromsky Show was brought to you in part by Chicago Architecture Center. Discover the breadth and majesty of Chicago's architecture on a Chicago Architecture Center bus tour. From bungalows to Bauhaus, our expert docents will share the fascinating stories behind our city's architecture. Book your tour at architecture.org slash tours. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm actually on a bus tour right now. Oh my, look at that wonderful piece of architecture. Get a special discount for Illinois residents from July 15th to August 15th. All Illinois residents get 50% off select walking tours. Visit architecture.org slash IL dash resident. Commercial break over. Welcome back to the Ben Jarofsky Show, live from the Chicago Sun-Times. 
Chris Welch, a state representative. Chris Welch is in the building. We've been talking about his legislation to uh, bring some compensation to athletes, co collegiate athletes in the state of Illinois. We're going to take a deep dive on that uh, in a bit. D, you got an update for me? Uh, absolutely here. It's uh, today's one of today's top stories locally. Uh, ben Jarofsky, you should have saw his face when he read this story. The Museum of Science and Industry will rename itself after Chicago philanthropist Ken Griffin. A lot of money that guy's making. Uh, he's making the largest donation in the institution's history. Uh, they announced this today. Ben, what were your thoughts on that again for those who may have just uh, tuned in? Beep, beep, beep. You can't <laughs> say I'm on air. Well, you could on a podcast, but uh, I'd prefer not to swear. I, I don't like it. Don't yeah, like it at all. He finds this news appalling, guys. But, hey. I get, I get what Kenny G is doing here, Ben. He's sticking his name in front of something that is unarguably awesome, right? The Kenny G Museum. Man, he must be a good guy, Kenny G. Also, but more importantly, really, it's great publicity, if you know what I mean. So, Ben, I think you'd be happy to know. I've been cutting some deals here okay. while you've been doing the show, all right? Oh, yeah? Yeah, I'm trying to get something named after you. Oh, okay. That'd be great publicity, uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. What are they so, hey, I, I, I've been cutting some deals, and I'm going to run some options by you. You let me know uh, what you think here. Uh, maybe we can <laughs> cut the deal, and uh, maybe we can get some uh, better advertising. You know what I mean? Okay. Just picture it, all right? Picture it in your head right now, okay? The Ben Jarofsky bike rack on Irving Park in oh, Damon. Oh, yeah, well, I ride a bike. Yeah, that's good. All right, Sounds there good, right? Yeah. All, all right. right, how about this? The Ben Jarofsky porta potty on Lawrence and Western. Uh, no, I don't like that Not one. Not that one? All right, okay. one more. I'm trying to cut this deal here. The Ben Jarofsky Show, Chicago Reader Newsstand oh, on the Racine Blue this, Line. Yeah. I, I, how about something with, uh, related to the Bulls, huh? Everybody knows I love my beloved okay. Bulls. Okay, may need uh, some Ken Griffin money to do something yeah, like that. Yeah, no, they're gonna uh, need maybe I can get uh, one of the concession stands there to represent you or something. I don't know. All right, I'm gonna keep. Uh, I'm gonna keep working. You uh, let me know. All right, the, the porta potty I don't like. All right, uh, Chris Welch is in the studio. Uh, welcome back. Hey Ben, uh, uh, thanks for having me. New digs. Uh, yeah, Chris, this is Chris, nice. Yes, it is very it's good nice here. It. Uh, and uh, Chris was a guest on my previous show uh, several times. But let's uh, introduce you to the new listeners, if they're out there. You're a state rep from the western suburbs, as I pointed out. Pride and Joy or Proviso West High School, correct? Hey. Proviso West. I don't know if I'm the Pride and Joy. Right. <laughs> and uh, Northwestern. And I'm doing this from memory. You played... I want to say outfield, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, at Northwestern University, you were you yourself were an athlete at Northwestern. I, I played baseball at Northwestern, and I tell people my claim to fame is uh, I played left field behind uh, probably the greatest shortstop in the history of Northwestern baseball, a current bench coach of the Chicago Cubs, and who knows, maybe the next manager, uh, Mark Loretta. Yeah, Mark Loretta, that is correct. Uh, and uh, so, wait a minute. So you're a, a Cub fan. You should be a White Sox fan, shouldn't you? You're trying oh. to position. What town did you grow up in? Cubs break my heart enough. <laughs> and the White, <laughs> White Sox don't really break hearts, okay? Because you have to be like good and then falter at the end like the Cubs to break oh, a heart. God. I think it was they lost nine in a row. I wasn't around in 69, but I hear 2019 was pretty similar. Uh, I was here in 1969, and I was far more. I, I was far obviously younger and more impressionable. 1969 was worse, in my humble opinion, than this. Uh, first of all, at least now the what, the Cubs had won a championship in 2016, so you're still basking in the glow of that. In 1969, it's still been 1906 uh, since they last won. So uh, anyway, I was very young. I was well. I heard their TV ratings were down this year, and that's probably because many of their fans were like me, and it, it's it was a a team that was hard to watch this year. Yeah. You know, you'd have six good games in a row and then it's just an unexplainable week. Right. Like that nine game losing yeah. streak. Just goes out of nowhere. Nowhere. Uh, How do you lose four run run games at home to the Cardinals? I, I do know no relief pitching. That's the, the short <sighs> answer to it right there. All right. Uh, I've been talking about your proposal uh, since the moment I heard about it and it began I've read about it in, uh, well, first of all, it began in California with a proposal uh, that the state house passed and was signed into law by Gavin Newsom, the governor of California. So uh, tell folks exactly uh, what you're proposing to do with your legislation. Well, uh, first of all, there's actually legislation patterned after a bill that was filed in Congress uh, by a Republican uh, a representative out of North Carolina, Mark Walker. He filed this legislation in March of this year. And then the California legislation uh, was the first, one of the first state uh, bills that got filed. Uh, and certainly California's making a big splash because Governor Newsom signed it into law this past uh, week. Uh, and 
they're the first in the country. Uh, and my bill is identical to the California bill. And basically what it says is, is that uh, colleges and universities uh, cannot prohibit student athletes from hiring agents if they want and signing endorsement deals, uh, particularly with regard to their, their name, their likeness, and their image. Mm-hmm. Colleges and universities and coaches have been making millions, the NCAA billions, off of these student athletes' uh, names, likenesses, and images for years, for decades. Uh, and I just think that the fair and equitable thing to do is let these student athletes uh, make money off their own names, likenesses, and images. Now, the bill in that passed and was signed in California is opposed by the NCAA which of course is the association that governs uh, college athletics. Uh, why, in your humble opinion, are they opposing this bill? Well, they say that uh, this blurs the line between amateurs and professional athletes. Hmm. Like that line wasn't blurred a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, w- w- they're making billions off of, of, of these amateur athletes. Uh, and I'm, this, isn't even, this isn't even a salary bill. This is not about having universities pay these athletes a salary. That's a different bill. That's a different issue. We might address that later. This is about them allowing them, if they want to, to sign agents and you know go after endorsement deals. And the bill is very tightly written. It wouldn't allow a student to get a contract that's in contradiction to their, their university. So Northwestern, my alma mater, they, they contract with Under Armour. Athlete can't go out there and sign a contract with Nike. The bill uh, prohibits that. Uh, but if they want to go sign a, a deal with the local Dick Sporting Goods and promote some products and sign a deal with the local car dealership, knock yourself out. Wow, no, that's interesting. I uh, I didn't realize you had that uh, stipulation in there. I'm thinking through it, everything you're saying right now. So in other words, uh, the uh, if you're a running back at Northwestern, uh, and you wanted to get a shoe deal, your own shoe deal, which is really the most lucrative as far as I know in terms of f- for uh, football players and basketball players, you can't do that. If it's inconsistent with the university's contract, you cannot. I see. But you could just go up, like, make an appearance at a local restaurant. The restaurants have a, a, a clipping. They're, they're opening up uh, their a, ch- a, a new branch, let's say, in Evanston, and you could show up and get an appearance fee give a little speech, et cetera, and so forth. Your bill would permit that. Exactly. And think about in these local college towns, for instance, Champaign or Evanston or any any college town, these athletes are enormous names in those communities. Mm-hmm. You can help a whole lot of local businesses and help local economies by allowing these uh, student athletes to promote these businesses. Uh, this is a good thing every way you look at it. Uh, and I don't I don't see how you can be against it. Uh, because it's about someone's own name, own likeness, own image. It's it's the fair and equitable thing to do. It helps the economy. Uh, it, you're not asking the universities to put out one penny whatsoever. Uh, and at the end of the day, and now I'm, 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 a, I'm a former athlete putting my hat on there. This is about recruiting too. California has a huge advantage right now. Hey, come to California and here's what you can do. It comes 2023. Uh, it, it, we're the only state that has this law on the books. That's big. Well, that's why I laughed out loud when I read that the coach from, I think it was, uh, which, where is he from? Mike Leach. Uh, I think he's uh, Washington State, was crying about the bill. And it, and I was just saying, y- you're just crying because you, you're not going to be able to recruit great football players out of the Bay Area anymore or out of Sacramento or L.A. or what have you. Oh, Hey, Washington and Oregon and all those other states better quickly pass a bill like this. That's why I filed it the same day the governor of California signed it yeah. so that we can be on par and on a level playing field. Because half my baseball team, Mark Loretta, the famous Mark Loretta we just talked about, mm-hmm. where is he from? California. He's on our baseball team in Evanston, Illinois. Uh, but we were on a level playing field back then. You know, with this law in the books, uh, and, and if we don't follow suit, it's going to be tough to get some of those California uh, top athletes to come this way. Now, Chris, when you uh, went to Northwestern and played baseball, were you a scholarship athlete? I was, I was not scholarship. I received financial aid uh, based on my family situation. Uh, but I'll tell you, there were a lot of students that were on scholarship and they still were struggling to just get by because there's other expenses that college students incur. 
And, you know, if you want to take some pressure off some of these athletes, you know, you're practicing all day long. Uh, I mean, long hours, you're in the training room, you're, you're going to class and you're doing homework and then you got to go and get an extra job just to take a girl out on a date. Uh, you know, just do, do simple things, right? How about allowing these guys to sign endorsement deals? Yeah. No, I, the, some of the, the stories I've read about the rules, uh, the NCAA and the way they enforce these rules, these, they're so frustrating. I, I remember reading a story many years ago, uh, Bill Walton, the great basketball player from UCLA uh, in the 70s, uh, his son was a basketball player at Arizona. And I remember Bill Walton telling a story that when he tried to take his son uh, and his friends of his, the sons, uh, out for dinner, the NCAA looked at, looked at that as a potential violation because it was like a, a booster that was rewarding players on the team. You take, like, any any parent, I know this, because I am a parent, you you miss your kid in college, you can end up taking like, half the floor out the dinner. <laughs> for dinner that night you know you're gonna take your kid and their friends yes yeah that's what happened and if you're an athlete your friends are your teammates so a booster yeah it's a parent taking his friends uh, his kids friends to dinner but it's a it's a violation of ncaa's crazy archaic rules now were you did you feel the sting of that when you were at northwestern in any way you know as a, as a non-revenue sport baseball player no and then no one was looking to chris welch to sign endorsement deals either or to to sign up, uh, but other players I'm sure did. I'll give you an example of why this doesn't make sense and why it's not fair. Mm-hmm. I was friends with a lot of students at Northwestern who were music majors. It's a great music school at Northwestern. A mm-hmm. um, lot of them are there on a college scholarship. And you know what else a lot of those music students do? Because uh, not far from Rogers Park, Evanston has a nice scene. On weekends, they take their musical talents and they make some side money in, in bars in Rogers Park or something. And it wasn't anything that would cost them their scholarship. How come a student athlete can't do the same thing that the music student is doing on scholarship? Making side money on their talent. It's not fair. It's all about fairness and equity. So what's so far been the reaction since uh, you, you introduced your bill from universities in Illinois? Well, I've, I've, I've had some uh early conversations with uh, Illinois and Northwestern, and they don't have official positions yet. And I, I got to believe that's because they have their lawyers looking at things and uh, vetting all the things that I'm out there saying publicly. Uh, you know, but, you know, we're ju- definitely trying to get them on the right side of history here, and hopefully they'll come out in support of this thing. Uh, but so far, you know, the uh, Illinois basketball coach sounds very positive on this thing. Pat Fitzgerald made some comments the other day that seemed pretty positive about it. It's the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. I haven't heard anyone come out against it. Pat Fitzgerald is the current football coach at Northwestern. I'm still questioning his decision to go for two as opposed to an extra point in last Saturday's game against Wisconsin. But I'm not allowed to talk sports in this show, so <laughs> we'll let that one slide uh, for the moment. Uh, the NCAA uh, says they're going to go to court in uh, California. And I think that's overkill, in my humble opinion. Uh, you know, the, I think that the public opinion would probably be in favor of the athletes. You think it's overkill on their part to go to court and fight this? Absolutely. The NCAA, though, has a bottomless pit of money. I mean, built on the backs of these student athletes. And so they're going to fight it. They're going to hire their lawyers. They're going to hire lobbyists. And they're going to keep fighting it. But their problem is, is this is a, a state issue that was passed unanimously by the California legislature. Uh, and, and I don't see the legal basis to overturn that new law. Uh, and that's why I patterned this law after the California law, because I thought it was extremely artfully crafted. Well, I'm trying to figure why, what their objection is. Uh, put aside whatever their stated objection is about amateurism. I'm always trying to fi- figure out what the real motivating factor is. What are they worried about? What are they concerned about? Uh, so one obvious answer is it will give an advantage to California in recruiting uh, and similarly it will give an advantage to Illinois if Illinois hurries up and passes this uh, over let's say Wisconsin if Wisconsin doesn't pass it so maybe that would help the uh, the Illini football team finally have a good year Uh, so I'm trying to figure out but why would the NCAA care about that I well I think it's even bigger than that uh, Ben I think it's uh, you know you're looking at this one rule and 
there's probably several other rules that need to be looked at and overturned. And they were probably just sending a signal, hey, you mess, mess with us, we're going to make you spend a lot of money uh, because they've got that much money to spend because uh, they don't want you, okay, after this rule, what's next? And I guarantee you, if we, we look closely, there's other archaic NCAA rules that are binding student athletes that should be tossed out of the off the books. So you're talking about the slippery slope argument uh, for the NCAA. I get you. Yeah. All right. You mentioned that it, your bill or the bill is patterned on a bill that uh, Republicans uh, sponsored in Congress. The obvious answer is uh, countrywide, nationwide. Then there would be no advantage for California or Illinois. There'd be no I, argument against it. Absolutely. Them. I think, you know, the bill in Congress needs to, they need to take a good hard look at that. I'm hoping it, it passes because then you got 50 states on level playing field. But right now, uh, absent that, you've got states doing what states do. Uh, Florida has a bill that Tim Tebow has come out in full support of that's very similar to this. New York has a piece of legislation. They take it a bit further because they throw the salary part in there. But the point is, is states are moving on this issue. It's, it's the national trend right now. And I think we can all thank Ed O'Bannon, uh, who sued the NCAA a few years ago, that started all of this because the, the, the courts have said, that individuals have a right to their own names, likenesses, and identities. And that started with... Uh, Didn't he uh, ultimately lose that case? Ed O'Bannon, the UCLA basketball player. I can't remember what happened with that suit. Well, they, they took it up on appeal, and they, they affirmed in part, which means he won. Mm -hmm. and they reversed a part where the lower court had put in that they there was a monetary value. Uh, so I think it was a big victory because they took out the monetary value and said you can't place a, 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 a limited number on it. So... Uh, all right, so you, you've introduced your bill, and now what's next here in Illinois? Let's get it passed. Uh, you know, we're continuing to build momentum. I'm having some great conversations uh, all across the board, reaching out to our universities, reaching out to our governor's office, uh, talking to my colleagues. We're gaining more sponsorships every day. And I'm hoping that we can move this thing at warp speed so that Illinois stays on a level playing field with California for recruiting purposes and we can get this thing passed in veto session at the end of the month. Now, all right, let's talk about that, uh, the veto session. If you're gonna get it passed in veto session, how many votes do you need? Well, uh, the effective date is 2023. So you need simple majorities, 60, 30, and one big signature. And you're gonna get the big signature being Governor Pritzker. Has he, I haven't seen, has he weighed in on this at all? He has not weighed in yet, but you know, he's been a heck of a, a, a governor to work with. And, uh, you know, at a minimum, I know I'm going to get an audience with him and, and have a fair shot at convincing him why this is a good position for the state. He's to a take. Northwestern grad, isn't he? He's I, a Northwestern I, I think grad. Right, he should care about Northwestern football North, uh, team. Northwestern Law School named after him. Uh, <laughs> he was on the Northwestern Board of Trustees before he became governor. Um, he should care about this issue. Yeah. What about Northwestern? More importantly, care about the student athletes. Has he, has Northwestern, I, I know you said Fitzgerald said that, uh, that Coach Fitzgerald said, uh, so some signs of support. Uh, what about, has the university itself weighed in? I didn't hear that. I understand they're still working on their formal position. I got you. Give you them know. four years. That's the other thing. 2023 doesn't take, I mean, why so long before the bill gets implemented? Well, I think number one, you definitely expect the legal challenges from the NCAA. You let that system play out. It's not going to, it shouldn't take that long. Mm -hmm. uh, also, to do this properly, to make sure that there's no uh, negative implications from the, the, the law, you need to, to allow time for proper rulemaking uh, and, and putting systems in place to make sure that uh, students aren't taken advantage of. All right, so that's the four years. Uh, and you said that it got uh, the support in, uh, of a Republican in Congress. Uh, what's the reaction of Republicans in the state of Illinois? So far, very positive. Uh, the bill has bipartisan support. Republicans have co-sponsored here so far. In California, the thing passed unanimously. It's the exact same bill as the California bill. So I'm expecting as I educate my colleagues as they call, uh, they're going to they're gonna come on board. It, and a big thing with my Republican colleagues is, is that what does it cost to the state? And when you find out it doesn't cost you a dime, it doesn't cost the state or the universities a dime, this is about allowing individuals to do what they should be allowed to do anyway, they'll be okay. Uh, Chris, before we uh, close the show down for the day, let's just talk br uh, briefly about uh, the, the state of Springfield uh, in in the last year. Uh, the last time we were in the show, I believe Rauner was still the governor. 
Who? <laughs> D, can you remind him of uh, Mr. Who? Who? Er, you know, Rauner? Uh, you remember Rauner? Uh, I forgot that guy's name a long time ago. Uh, <laughs> for our teachers. There you go. Uh, for our teachers. That guy. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, so in, 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 how have things changed in Springfield uh, in those last year or so in your view? The governor's been a breath of fresh air. Uh, his governing style is so different. We had a historic session, uh, and I think that was a lot because of the governor's leadership. He got involved intimately, personally, on a lot of these issues that we were able to pass. Uh, I thought we had one of the best Mays you'll ever see in Springfield, and that was because of this governor's type of leadership. Uh, it's night and day. You can't compare the two. Uh, uh, that's that's the best I can say. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I don't remember the other one. Uh, I for, you forgot the other one's name. You, you do it back then. I can tell you that uh, for sure. What are some of the issues you're looking forward to uh, dealing with in this veto session? Well, I'm looking forward to just getting back and seeing my colleagues and uh, uh, talking about our summers that we've had. There's going to be some cleanup things that we need to do with this gaming bill uh, that, that we passed. Some Probably some cleanup with the cannabis legislation. Uh, there's, there's some work to be done. Uh, and, of course... We, we can't leave town without passing this important legislation on the NCAA. And that will be it. I got a, I got, I have a feeling I'm going to make a prediction here that you'll pass the legislation on the, uh, on this, on the college athletes before you clean up the gaming bill. I got a feeling <laughs> your legislation's a lot easier to clean up than the gaming bill. Something tells me you're right. I, I think I'm right. <laughs> Especially as the gaming bill affects a casino in the city of Chicago. Uh, you're from the Western suburbs. I said, you don't have any part of the city in your district. Do you? I have no part of the city in my district. And uh, so how does the gaming bill affect, or does it affect the Western suburbs? Well, I mean, I, I think the gaming bill is extremely important, uh, even to the suburbs like uh, represent, like I represent. Uh, in the current legislation, uh, the village of Maywood, uh, which is uh, seen as a depressed community uh, for several reasons, benefits from this gaming bill because there's a revenue sharing agreement uh, where Maywood receives portions of the tax funds that come from a Chicago casino. Uh, so there's reasons for me to root for Chicago, getting a city, a casino that uh, everyone can afford, and it starts generating tax revenue because it, it would it would come out our way as well. Do you have any sense of when that'll happen? I'm hoping in veto session you we think can get this will? addressed. If not, 2020. 2020, yeah. It could be a lot. They, they're getting into changing, just so people know what we're talking about. Uh, originally it was uh, i think the the split was going to be a third of all proceeds go to the operator of the casino a third goes to the city and a third goes to the state and uh the, the city of chicago did a study uh, mayor Lori life did a study and the, the result of the study said that that's not enough money uh to encourage a uh, a private uh no one's interested yeah no one wants they don't think they can make, make enough money so you have to change the ratio to give more money uh to the operator which of course uh, Chris means less money for somebody, either the state or the city or a combination thereof. And that's why I think it's going to be a little tricky uh, to get yeah. that passed. We got to get everyone in the room and we got to figure it out. Uh, I've seen several other regions announce their casino plans, but Chicago, which has been breaking tourism records year after year after year, we can take advantage of those tourists that come to our city, let them spend some money in a Chicago casino and, you know, let's pay our teachers. Let's hire some nurses and librarians and send some money out to Maywood. All right, send some money out to Maywood. Chris Welch up, uh, puts <laughs> Maywood on the list as well. Uh, State Representative Chris Welch, thanks for coming in. I appreciate it. Uh, I also want to thank Ed Maher, who was on the show earlier, and Miles Conf Lassen uh, from In These Times was here at 1.30. And of course, we oh, before we go, we have an update here. Uh, by the way, Ben, I, I cut a deal. The Bulls said no, by the way. Oh, on that. They said no. Uh, okay. But this, this update is brought to you by the Ben Jarofsky Show, a uh, dedicated smoking room at Double J Sports Bar <laughs> in Joliet, Illinois. I never smoked a cigarette in my life. That's all right. People are going to know about us, okay? We have a teacher strike update. Mayor Lori Lightfoot, in her attempts to cut a deal with the Chicago Teachers Union, said today that she will not tolerate any attempt by the Chicago Teachers Union to shorten the school day for elementary school students by adding a half hour of paid preparation time at the start, uh, start of the school day. Uh, well, that, I figured that was coming. There was a story in today's paper uh, in which uh, that issue was introduced. Again, there's a lot of posturing going on. Everybody's trying to win over the public uh, uh, on this dispute. And uh, 
So Lori Lightfoot, now this is her attempt, I think, uh, D, uh, to make it seem as though she's standing up for something and part of the public. And everybody knows I'm, I, I haven't, I'm not hiding anything here. I'm very much for uh, almost everything that the, the, the union is asking for in terms of hiring more nurses, more social workers, uh, more counselors, some librarians. So it's okay to talk about this, the length of the school day. How about what kids are doing in school during that day, if you have an extra hour of school and you don't have a librarian or you don't have an art program or a music program or a drama program. I mean, Chris Welch was lucky. He went to one of the good suburban school systems. He was in the prov uh, Proviso West. But a lot of kids in Chicago, Chris, and you know this, I went to Evanston High School. They don't have the same things we had at Evanston and Proviso West. I can tell you, at Proviso West, I had a great librarian, great school social worker, counselors, all of those services I took a uh, big advantage of. Yeah. Yeah. And that's yeah. how you got to Northwestern. I couldn't have done it without them. So uh, it's, like I said, it's great to have a full day, with six hour day, seven hour day, what have you, but let's make sure it's a meaningful day. And you can only do that if you have some good employees. So that's my take on that. Uh, Chris Welch, thank you so much. Dr. D, you're the man, you're the myth, you're the legend. Give yourself a raise, take it out of petty cash. See you tomorrow, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. And remember, you can download previous Ben Jarofsky shows and Benny J bonus interviews at both Chicago Sun-Times and Chicago Reader websites, chicago.suntimes.com, chicagoreader.com, and wherever else you download podcasts. Hey, downloaders, you know we live stream this show, right? It's true. Tuesdays through Fridays, 1 until 3 p.m. Central Time at both Chicago Sun-Times and Chicago Reader websites, the Chicago Sun-Times YouTube channel, and we now Facebook video live stream at Benny J Show, B-E-N-N-Y, the letter J Show. Give us a like, follow, share, review, whatever you want to do. Be sure to read Ben's latest article involving the Chicago Teachers Union's possible strike. And we'll see you tomorrow. That's correct.